we're super lucky to have with us Kelsey Van Haster. Now, if you work at ThoughtWorks, you know Kelsey. She's one of our global team who uh, doesn't seem to have any concept of normal sleep rhythms. She'll participate in any part of the world for ThoughtWorks in making things better. And if things get bad, she's also a wonderful person to have on your side if there's there security issues or changes. Can't even begin to imagine how she manages all of that complexity. She's known to us officially as a principal consultant and the product owner for Identity. She's caused revolutions at ThoughtWorks in making our lives easier and easier as we face the, the kind of the themes of this XCOMP of an ever more tricky and feeling slightly dangerous world. Um, the talk today, and if I just share the screen, you'll be able to see it quickly before she shares her own, is passwordless, which I, it's, it's a, a quite, quite a handful and a mouthful, that one, a story of risk protection and excellent user experience. And Kelsey's another one of those thought workers who's quite capable of stepping between highly technical issues and things I thought only social scientists were interested in, human behavior, emotions, and all those kind of things. So Kelsey, thank you so much for kicking off our afternoon. I'm looking forward to this one <clears throat> a great deal. Over to you. So yes, before we get started, um, Mark Twain said there are two kinds of speakers, those who are nervous and those that are liars. I never tell lies, so be kind. Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you about the security holy grail, a way to reduce risk, protect high value user accounts and deliver an excellent user experience. To provide you with some context, my role at ThoughtWorks is primarily an internally facing one. Um, as Nigel mentioned, I'm the product owner for internal for the internal ThoughtWorks identity product, and I lead a remote first globally distributed team. And uh, we follow the sun and deliver identity and access management to 10,000 people or so. This is how I hope it's going to go. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk briefly about passwords in general, why they're awful, um, and then I will talk about passwordless or modern authentication, um, which is the other term that's used to describe this. And then finally, I'll talk about an experiment with passwordless that we did at ThoughtWorks, what went well, what didn't go so well, and what my customers, thought workers, thought about the experience. So, passwords. Before we dive into this, though, um, I'd like to share with you a little reminder of the experience that we often have with passwords. So yes, <clears throat> passwords, all the fun that we all have. So a password, sometimes called a passcode, a memorized secret 
typically a string of characters, usually used to confirm your identity. So research from October 2020 reveals that the average individual has more than 100 individual passwords to remember. And that is a growing number. I think I probably acquired another couple today. It's already unmanageable and it's not getting any better. In an ideal world, every one of those 100 passwords would be long, they would be complex, and they would be unique. But we know, I know, you know, that's just not true, as do the bad folks. People just want to get things done. So they're always going to take the path of least resistance. And often that means using the same password across multiple logins or developing a probably predictable pattern for their passwords. You know, my dog's name born in X year with a new number on the end. Um, I imagine we've all got one of those floating around somewhere. People also share passwords. Hello, Netflix. How many of us have shared our Netflix password with our family? So, how can I stop you from using your Pinterest password, password for work? Obviously, I care about security. It's my job. I care a lot about the security of the corporate assets that I am responsible for. So I would really like you not to use your favorite social media shopping site password um, on my corporate assets, if you don't mind. So what I'm probably going to do is I am going to insist that your corporate credentials have some rules around them. I'm going to require you to make it a minimum length. Not as long as I'd like, but a minimum length. I'm going to require that you probably include some uppercase characters, some lowercase characters, maybe a non-alphanumeric character in there too. Um, no, you can't include your name, and no, it can't be any of the last X number of passwords you may have used. Oh yeah, and I'm also gonna make you change it for something completely different every X number of days. So I've just made your life hard, and I've probably annoyed you as well. But despite all of that, Pass databases are dumb and people are smart. And my password one, two, three exclamation mark probably meets the requirements. The other concern, of course, is that nothing stops you from using this new secure password in multiple places. You might think, oh, that's a great password. I'll use that everywhere else too. Fantastic. Or you might write it on a sticky note or share it with your housemates so that they can watch Netflix too. I'm not even going to get into discussing how the bad folks respond to these kinds of rules and these kinds of safeguards that we try to put in place, other than to say that they're probably not very worried about them. So you might ask, well, what about password managers? Yeah, they help a bit, but there are issues with those too. Um, and I might add, at ThoughtWorks, part of the benefits we provide to every thought worker is a family subscription to a well-known password manager, as well as to a corporate password manager, so that they can do the right thing and secu securely manage work-related credentials. Uptake of the benefit is very good. People like it, but it's probably not universal. The concerning thing, of course, is that the people least likely to adopt and champion the use of this particular product are the users for whom technology is not a speciality. People from finance, people from people teams, people from other non-technical functions. And these are arguably the people with the most access to the most critical data and the least amount of time and energy to put into taking care of it. Besides this, I don't know if you've ever tried to teach anyone to use a password manager from scratch if they've never ever used one before, particularly again someone whose expertise is not in tech. It's not very easy um, and it's really easy to get yourself into a mess. 
There are also concerns that some people have about the security of having all of your credentials stored in a password manager or otherwise reasons that you might lose access to all of your passwords. So a password manager is great. I love them. I use one every day, but it's not a silver bullet. A weak and easily guessed password stored in a password manager is still a weak and easily guessed password. So what's better? Passwordless is better. What is passwordless? Much like it says on the tin, it's a way to access a system without using a password. Um, and it's very secure, it uses a public private cryptographic key pair. Try saying that um, on Friday evening. But it's the way that this works um, as well is that the public key is registered with the authenticating service, your identity provider, for example, and the private key is kept on the end user's device. The really nice thing about passwordless um, that I'm going to talk about is that words like cryptographic key pair and authenticating service, which probably make half of the room's eyes glaze over, are completely transparent to the end user. They don't need to know anything about the technology behind this to use it. How does it work? Kind of like this. The user, the person wanting to log in, provides some kind of identifier, username or an email. And then they verify their identity using one or more acceptable factors. Commonly, this might be an ownership factor, your phone, or an inheritance factor, your fingerprint, your face. Um, and the system evaluates that and has a look at the behavior. And if the behavior is low risk, as in they're signing in from the same IP address, the same browser, the same country, that they have done the last 10 times, then, yep, the user is signed in. If the risk, the system considers the risk to be different, in other words, I'm suddenly logging in from somewhere that I've never ever been before, and I was in Melbourne half an hour ago, the system is then going to step up and prompt me for a second challenge. Um, this might be then, okay, now use a verification app on your phone as well. The system will then evaluate whether or not I've successfully verified my identity. And if I have, then I get to sign in. If I haven't, then access is denied. For most users, the process is really seamless. It's fast and it feels like magic. For most systems admins and infosec teams, it means that we really now have strong, adaptive and intelligent authentication. We've got better peace of mind and massively reduced amounts of failure demand, which is something I'll talk about a little bit more as we go. Um, an aside is that it gets you a fair few steps towards operating in a zero trust or a beyond trust environment, but that's a whole other talk for a, a whole other conference. So how different, less, different is passwordless from MFA? Well, it is different. MFA is important. You should always turn it on wherever it's available. But like passwords, it's got weaknesses. Many systems offer MFA via SMS. This is inherently insecure in itself. In many places in the world, stealing somebody's phone number is absolutely trivial. Certain types of MFA are vulnerable to man in the middle attacks and phones get lost and stolen all the time. Um, believe me, I deal with this problem on multiple times every single day, it happens. Um, many people still don't secure their mobile phones with passcodes or biometric, or they use really weak passwords, you know, 1111 or something like that. And then there are further challenges when people travel or they don't have access to their mobile number or they drop their phone in the bath and it gets wiped. All of these things happen. There are some significant benefits um, 
for organisations that arise from passwordless, which are significant. We have experienced at ThoughtWorks from trying this reduced failure demand from lost or forgotten passwords. Um, reduced need for complex policies around length, complexity or cycle, cycle time, a super fast and seamless um, onboarding process. And the thing that I love the most being identity product owner is it completely prevents people from sharing credentials, just brings that to a total halt. So for the organization, Adopting passwordless means that there are suddenly a whole lot of things that you don't need to do anymore. Plus, you can have really high levels of confidence that authentication is strong and credentials are not being shared. What about our end users? Well, much, much, much better security for accounts, for starters, but the lovely, lovely part is that it is a much, much better user experience for our end users. <clears throat> There's always a catch. Nothing is perfect. There is an adoption curve for both internal IT teams and for end users. You're going to do something different. Potential costs. And we do still have a single point of failure depending on how it's been Im implemented. So the reality is there is no such thing as a free lunch. Moving to passwordless means organizational change. It means conversations with your information security team, just to start with. Depending on how you implement it, there could be a cost if you decide to go and buy security keys for everybody in your organization. There's a, potentially a cost involved there. One of the other things that's a challenge as well is telling a super busy, not tech focused end user that you want to come along and completely change the way they sign into systems may not be something that they get wildly enthusiastic about. Um, and to the final point, managing one time passwords or distributing security keys, those kinds of things. That can be a single point of failure if those devices are lost or stolen or people just buy a new phone and forget that their authentication is tied to their old one. That happens. But anyway, we tried this out. And what I'd like to do is share with you what our experience was like. It's important to have a bit of context here. Um, Nigel has talked a lot about how different ThoughtWorks is and we're a little bit different from an internal tech perspective as well. Um, we're a consultancy, of course. The vast majority of our employees don't work from our office. They work from our clients' offices. Further, we don't have any on-premise infrastructure. There are not rows and rows of desktop PCs and fixed networks in our offices. We don't use um, local file shares. We don't have an internal fixed network. And all of our applications, except for a very, very tiny number, are SaaS-based, including our identity provider. We also like to do things differently. Yes, we do manage our IT assets. They're about 95% or so Mac, but with a super light touch. You can totally change your, um, your screen background or your browser if that's what you wanna do. We don't interfere at that kind of level. We also support BYOD for non-primary devices. So phones and tablets, you can absolutely bring your own device to work. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't issue security keys or hardware tokens, typically. So initially doing something like passwordless looked like it might be a bit difficult for us to do. But then um, early last year, a couple of things changed and broad support became available for FIDO2 and web or then. 
and I'll explain a little bit about what that means. So FIDO2 is a set of standards that specify how users can securely authenticate to internet services without relying on a password. And WebAuthn is the WC3 standard for authenticating devices, so hardware or biometric, biometric tokens, so Touch ID, Face ID, or security keys, um, all of these. WebAuthn then enables online services to use FIDO authentication through a standard web API that's built into browsers and related web platform in infrastructure. And if you recall, I said before, our applications are SaaS based. We work through the web and we have Macs. So what this meant for us was that pretty much every thought worker now had a device with some form of biometric identifier, touch ID, face ID, it's built in. We didn't need to issue security codes to people. Um, and secondly, adaptable sign-on policies supporting credential changing, which training, which I'll talk about in a second, became available via our IDP. So what's an adaptable sign-in policy? So an adaptable sign-in policy is one where you can specify the circumstances under which a user can authenticate based on their behavior. For example, are they using the same device, the same browser as last time? Are they signing in from the same location or the same IP address? If not, and again, depending on who the user is, you can issue them with one or more or several additional challenges, or you can deny access to certain resources or all resources. And the other thing that you can do is you can set up different policies for different groups of users, depending on what the perceived risk actually is. So these things together meant that we actually were in a position to give this a try um, and that we actually had all of the tools that we needed on hand. We didn't need to go out and buy 10,000 security keys. So we decided to use some hypotheses driven design. Um, we spend a lot of time verifying people's identity and resetting passwords. And to reset a user's password takes four to five back and forth interactions between IT support and end users. It's slow, it's painful, and you know, on top of all the problems that we've talked about with regard to passwords, it generates a lot of failure demand. We spend a lot of time um, doing this and we saw this as an opportunity to do that a lot less. So we developed a hypothesis and our hypothesis was that we believe that using password lists to sign into ThoughtWorks systems and services will result in a faster, more convenient and secure end user experience. So we designed, you have a hypothesis, you need to design a test for it. So we designed a test to evaluate our hypotheses. And that in short involved setting up a security policy to support passwordless, and we selected a credential chain, which I talked about a little bit earlier, um, combined with um, behavior detection. So WebAuthn, so you could use your MacBook Touch ID, you can use your Windows Face ID, I don't know what that's called, um, or you can use a security key, any kind of hardware security key. And then we added in um, Okta Verify with push as the step up for when we wanted to add an additional challenge. Nicely as well, um, one of the lovely things that, that happens without us actually having to do anything at all is that if you sign in on your phone, 
um, Okta recognizes immediately that no, your phone probably doesn't have a security key attached to it, although you can use one if you have the right key. So it automatically switches over and uses Okta Verify to um, support people for logging in. And that happened without that happens without us having to do anything about it at all, which is great. The next thing we did was call out for volunteers um, who met certain requirements and who were willing to try it out. And we were very clear about the fact that, yep, this is an experiment. We don't know how well it's going to work at the start. We may find some things that don't work that well. And what we wanted people to do was self-register their own web authn token. Um, either a physical key or a biometric, and to download and enroll into Okta Verify. And we made it very clear that, um, yes, we will be there to support them if things went wrong, but they might. So we ended up initially with about 120 volunteers and these were folks in a wide range of roles um, they were based all across the the world um, it was everyone from engineers to project managers to um, you know leadership folks in various countries um, and with this regard we specifically reached out and directly targeted what we refer to as high value accounts, um, which are not accounts with a lot of money in them, but they're people with access to critical data um, for whom extra, extra security is really, really important. So we also directly reached out to a lot of those folks um, to see if we could get them to, uh, to join our trial. And they did, and off we went. And we learned some stuff. Um, things were not quite as seamless as we'd hoped. Pretty good, but not perfect. Um, we did discover that you still need to set and update a compliant password, even though you never use it. Um, some of this is related to the way that our infrastructure is set up. Some of it's related perhaps to the fact that we have some users using this approach and some users not, but you still have to do that. And if you don't change your password when you get to the end of our normal cycle time, then you're just as locked out as you would have been otherwise. And um, you don't even have the ability to reset it yourself. So that's a gotcha. Um, we also discovered that not all browsers support web authn. Um, at the time, we recommended using Chrome because Chrome supports this very, very nicely. Um, Safari initially did not, but now does. Um, and there are there is a defect, um, a public defect in uh, Mozilla in Firefox that prevents it from using um, the Touch ID. Uh, technology here and people are pretty keen on the browser that they like and that was a barrier for some people they couldn't use the browser that they preferred to use so they chose not to participate one of the things that we also discovered was that there was the odd bit of command line tech that still required a password that wouldn't accept um, wouldn't accept the use of Touch ID as an authentication source. One of these in particular was the way that we were using AWS at the time. Um, happily, I can now report that that problem is going away due to new SSO support for um, AWS that works with the IDP tech that we're currently using. But that was a challenge for some people as well. Um, they would have liked to have participated, but the work that they were doing made this um, less than possible. But everybody loved it. We did a little bit of a survey and we asked people for 
a couple of things, some quotes, which some of which I'll share with you in a minute, um, but also a, you know, a one word thing and best ever, love it, fantastic, don't take this away from me. That was just what we were hearing. Um, people really, really like it. It's secure and it's so fast. You always need to have some direct quotes. So um, yeah, here are some of the, the quotes that we got back to from um, our customers. Um, very low friction. People often say, I used to curse Okta credential challenges. Now I barely register when I have to log in again. Um, it's safe, secure, and the easy way to log in. I don't have to depend on any other tools or machines. Um, not having to go through one password every time I want to access something in Okta. It's integrated really well into my workflow and uses secure authentication without security compromise, doesn't rely on passwords which may or may not be strong enough. And the one that we heard most often, I can't imagine going back to the old system. So for a security change, I reckon that's pretty good feedback. From an IT admin perspective, so that's me and my team, um, the trial group experienced almost no issues at all, very small number of some of the things that I've highlighted. Um, a small number of people found new and very creative ways to paint themselves into a corner. Um, it is possible to register a biometric on a phone and then discover that it doesn't give you access to your laptop. That, that is a thing that you can do or just registering a biometric and then trying to log in on your phone, which also doesn't work. Um, one of the interesting things, um, and going back to what I said earlier about less technical users, some of the terminology that we use, web or thin and cryptographic key, um, scared some people off. Um, and I think that's always a balance as well when you're working with technology group of technologists and not so technologists, not so tech focused, focused people. Um, the need for communication is um, is very important. You need to be able to reach out to both groups of um, customers. The more technical people want to know all the details, the people whose focus is not tech really don't. They just want to sign in. Um, and I do still need to remind people that they need to update their password when prompted to do so. Um, yeah, it's it's not top of mind for most people, understandably. From a larger organizational perspective, this was excellent. It was low, no cost. For us, there was no new cost involved in this. We used something that we already had. Um, we didn't need to run a massive organizational change project. Um, from our perspective, we needed to write some new security policies for our IDP, but that was really not, not difficult, complex or time consuming um, at all. Um, we have much improved confidence around securing access. Um, I know that the people with passwordless are not using their Pinterest password on my corporate assets. Um, and it significantly reduces our exposure to potential attacks and every organization is under attack all of the time these days. So um, there are a lot of benefits all around from that perspective. So to wrap things up, and I'm probably a little under time, I'm sorry, Nigel, you might have to pull out your playlist. Um, this was really straightforward to implement. It wasn't hard. It didn't take us long to figure out how we might be able to do this. Um, yeah, it was non-complex um, to do. The user experience is fantastic. 
to have something that is a massive improvement in security and a massive improvement in user experience is not something that you get every day. And that is just the coolest thing about it. It's low effort, low cost. It's reduced failure demand um, really significantly for us and IT support costs. And in amongst the passwordless group, that demand for resets or password support has just gone. It's completely disappeared. And much better security makes our security teams and our auditors extremely happy, which is always a good place to be. So where are we at? So we've been running this trial now for a few months, nine months, maybe. Um, we've got a bit more than the initial 120 users now, as people have heard about it, people come to us and say, hey, can I join? And we go, yeah, please. Um, what we would like to do is make it available to anybody who wants to try. So that's, that's a communications job on our part. We think we can make much more nuanced use of the behavior technology available to us in not just the locking people out direction, but also in the other direction um, where we have a very high degree of trust. Um, we can make it even easier for people to log in under those circumstances. And we very much want to spend some time exploring um, how we might do that. And then the other thing that's coming up, which is super interesting to us, is that our IDP is likely about to make available some technology for us, um, which will move us yet another step further towards the goal of zero trust and actually using the device as the security perimeter rather than um, the old idea of network as the perimeter. And finally, um, I would like to encourage anybody who is in a position to do so to consider trying this out. Um, it is supported by a large number of um, technologies and vendors in the IDP space um, and in the tech space. For us, this was a very low code or no code solution. You can also, if you are with an organization that tends to write its own solutions to these things. There are code-based ways of supporting this too. Um, and we, we don't think that you'll regret it if you, uh, if you give it a shot. And we're very happy to share what we've learned. And that is it. Well, that's wonderful, Kelsey. And uh... Funnily enough, that exact slide you just moved off, I'm going to share it now so people can continue the conversation on Slack if they want to. A few people over there and a couple of questions actually, so you're not getting away uh, too lightly. And I just want to acknowledge on behalf of all the ThoughtWorks who've benefited from you and your team's work, uh, just how wonderful it is to be part of something that's a bit cutting edge. Now, uh, someone did ask about what you think about the accuracy of biometrics. I mean, come on, let's, let's face it, my laptop is built of the lowest cost components that the sourcing manager could find at the company. Um, what do you think? Are, are the, you know, my fingerprint on the little dial on top of my Mac, is it reliable? Is it, are they investing more in that space? That's, um, it, there are a lot of people around here who could answer that question far better than I can, but I'll share what I think. Um, no, it's not perfect. It's not perfect at all. Um, but it's better than a password. And it's better than a password that's sitting on Pinterest or a shopping site. Um, if I had everything in the world that I wanted, I would be issuing every thought worker with a nice little YubiKey um, on their first day. But, you know, I don't have that. So, so no, I, I agree that it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than what we had before is um, where I sit with it. 
All right. Well, because I'm a social scientist, I get to ask the, the human questions as well as the technical ones. And I'm, I'm curious, what, what motivates what the team? What, what gets you up in the morning? It is, you mentioned the, the, the reduction in waste, which I mean, it's fun to get rid of waste. Absolutely. I know that as a lean person. But, you know, is it your, is it your love of people and helping them? What, what gets you up to focus on making such a radical improvement in our tech? Oh, goodness. Um, it's, it's primarily about, and, and this is going to sound strange for a product, but it's primarily about, I want to have a product that nobody knows exists. I want us to be so, um, that I want the thought worker experience to be so seamless and so secure that they don't even know that we exist. A, a key metric for us when we make a significant organizational change, um, and we do, is that nobody notices. I don't get in your way. I don't stop you delivering and solving your clients' problems. I don't have you screaming in frustration and hating the products that we provide. And that's what gets me up in the morning. Um, as a team, we are always looking at what is driving our failure demand on a given day. What are people having trouble with? And we target our efforts on solving that problem next. Well, the result is fantastic, that's for sure. And I, I'm going to ask a personal question too, like as a, as a member of the boomer generation, particularly, and I in the, in the chat, I was talking about a dilemma I had recently with a password with my 86-year-old dad. Are some of these things good answers to a generational gap that exists with technology as, as an aging population with access to mobile devices and scanning in and COVID locations, all that kind of stuff? Are you seeing some of this tech being great for that? Um, this particular one really is because you just you don't because it's so easy to set up and use. Um, all of the sophisticated stuff is is really transparent to the user. I mean, to enroll your fingerprint, you just say touch that there. That's it. That's all you got to do. Touch that thing, and you're done. Um, you know, and and that's that's really good. Um, I think I mentioned earlier on, you know, people are busy, it's hard to get their time, but when you do manage to get five minutes of your time um, and you're able to give them three minutes back because it was so easy to, to do what you wanted to do, then, you know, they're really pleased. So I think potentially it does help. We've just got to keep it simple and not complicated. Make it simple, remove the barriers, and success is when you can't see it at all and we don't think about it. I think that's a, a great way to wrap that up, Kelsey. So thank you so much. I know you put a ton of effort into making that very big and long project fit into a short space of time for the XCONF audience. 